and welcome to our online service here at St Paul's to Vuren. Uh, it's great to have you with us this morning, uh, whether you are uh, watching at home alone on a Sunday morning, uh, whether you're away on holiday or maybe uh, later in the day as you've been doing uh, other things this morning, maybe helping out with our children's groups. Uh, wherever you are, uh, it's great to have you with us this morning. We're just going to open with some words uh, at the start of our service. Please do join in the words in yellow. God has called us here this morning. All the world give God your praises. Let us thank him for his goodness. All the world give God your praises. Let us ask him to forgive us. All the world give God your praises. Let us learn what he would teach us. All the world give God your praises. Let us bring our prayers before him. All the world give God your praises. Shout for the joy to the Lord who loves us. All the world give God your praises. As we start our service together, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather wherever we are, uh, even if we're not uh, together in body, but we are together in spirit. So as we worship together this morning, be amongst us, touch our hearts, uh, shape us to your likeness and help us to be doing your works wherever we are and whatever you are calling us to do. We ask these things for your name's sake. Amen. Our opening song is a song which is a song of trust. So important, isn't it, in these difficult times when we don't understand so much of what is happening around us that we need to learn to walk faithfully uh, with God at our side. Uh, this wonderful song from Psalm 23 helps us to remember those truths. of things I thought it would be really helpful for you to know in the coming weeks. Next Sunday the 2nd of August at our 10.30 service 
we will be doing a service of Holy Communion. It's a long time since we've been able to gather together around the Lord's table as a church family, and that is our first opportunity to do so. Uh, great to have you there if you'd like to come for that. If you're slightly hesitant about how we might do communion, please do come anyway. There'll be no, uh, no need to take communion uh, on the day if you're not happy doing so. We also recognise that uh, without our nine o'clock service, we haven't really had an opportunity to have a kind of a more quieter service. So on Wednesday, the 19th of August, we will be doing a Wednesday evening communion service at St. Jan's in, here in Tavuren at eight o'clock. And also, I know we don't normally do it, but in August, we thought it would be just good to continue praying for our church, uh, for our world. So there will be a prayer meeting on Wednesday, August the 5th, um, again at 8pm at St. Jan's in Tavuren. We're now going to have a, a video. Uh, if you're not able to join us, in, as you've not been able to join us in church this morning, uh, you may not know that the Lloyd Davis family are leaving us. And uh, we wanted them just to be able to say goodbye. And so here is a video that they recorded for us earlier this week. Hello, St. Paul's family. This is the Lloyd Davis family on our last Sunday here at church with you all. And we just wanted to say a few words about why you mean so much to us. We felt so much a part of the church family here at St. Paul's and we're going to find it difficult to say goodbye. But once at St. Paul's, always at St. Paul's. So we hope this will be much more au revoir tot zines rather than goodbye. Please do keep in touch. We're moving to a small market town in just north of London. And uh, we wanted to just thank you for welcoming us, building us up and now sending us out for our next chapter. And one thing we really want to remind and encourage you all about is firstly, how welcoming the church is. And we have felt so welcomed and so integrated and plugged in. But secondly, the deep grace that runs throughout the church. If you, if you think about all the different nationalities, all the different denominations, and yet there's superb and wonderful unity. And that is something not to be taken for granted. I think it's a real gift, a very powerful, and a great witness to many other churches around the world. So from all of us, a huge thank you. We look forward to spending eternity with you, but we hope to see you before now and then. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. A reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, beginning at the first verse. Come, all you who are thirsty, Come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendour. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it blood, bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy 
and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We've just heard in our Bible reading, why, 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 as God asks of the Israelites, why it is that their behaviour is like this? Why is it that they are pursuing things that take them away from God rather than towards him? We might not have to answer those same kinds of questions, but God does ask us the same, doesn't he? He asks us, why is it that we turn away from him, whether through weakness, through the choices we make, or maybe intentionally too? So let's come before God and spend a moment in quiet as we come before him, asking him to forgive us our wrongdoing and hearing his words of assurance of the forgiveness we receive when we put our faith and trust in Jesus. In the Bible it says, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So together we say, Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts and mind and strength. We have not fully loved our neighbours as ourselves. We have not always had in us the mind of Christ. You alone know how often we have grieved you by wasting your gifts by wandering from your ways, by forgetting your love. Forgive us, we pray you, most merciful Father, and free us from our sin. Renew us in the grace and strength of your Holy Spirit, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. Amen. To all who confess themselves to be sinners, humbling themselves before God, and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. I declare this sure promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen. We may have just taken a moment to acknowledge our own unfaithfulness, the fact that our love wanders, but God is not like that. And our next song picks up that theme, that God's love to us is steadfast in Jesus Christ.
The reading today is Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. <clears throat> then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son today. I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. The parable of the sower. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered round him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell along rocky places, where it did not have much soil, it sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. This is the fourth of our summer series, looking at the true nature of the best, the most important person there is and whoever will be, who's the reason why we're here today, King Jesus. So far we've seen how Jesus was promised, how when he came he healed people, and that he was opposed. And later in the series, we'll see how he has compassion, how he was rejected, and that he was a king to be seen and one who causes us to follow him. But today we're looking at what is at the heart of who Jesus is, that is, a preaching king. And it's worth us remembering that as with all these aspects, Jesus is not exactly how we imagined he would be, nor does he necessarily conform to the type of king or person or saviour we would actually like him to be. Two weeks ago, our chaplain Dominic explained that from very early in his public ministry, Jesus explained why he came. It comes in chapter 1, where after Jesus is baptised, he goes into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And we read in 138, Jesus says, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. This is why I have come. The reason, Je the reason Jesus gives us is that he's come to preach, to proclaim the good news of God. And as the story of Jesus' ministry unfolds in Mark, we see that when Jesus preaches and teaches people about the kingdom of God, he draws a great deal of interest. His words intrigue people, and they're backed up with displays of power to underline the truth of what he's saying. Jesus forgives sins, which only God can do, when he heals a man who's paralysed. Jesus heals a man who had leprosy, a terrible disease that cuts the sufferer off from society. But Jesus heals him, 
and restores him to his family and to the community. Jesus also healed many others who came to him, not because that was the primary purpose of his mission, but because these pointed to God his Father as the giver of life and the restorer of souls, and because of Jesus' love and compassion for each and every person that he created, one who bears the image of God. So large crowds flocked to Jesus. In 133, we read, the whole town gathered. In chapter 2, the crowds were so large that the people had to climb up on top of the house and make a hole in the roof to lower the paralysed man down so he could even get to Jesus. In chapter 3, we read that the crowds came from near and far, from the Jewish world in Judea, Jerusalem, and from the Gentile world of Tyre and Sidon. And here in today's passage, we read, the crowd gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people were along the shore's edge. Why had they come? Remember, Jesus came to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. But he knew that the people had a very different understanding of what that would look like, and what the promised Messiah, the anointed one of God, would be and what he would do. We read in the Gospel accounts that some were looking for the Messiah to be a king and to restore the greatness of David's kingdom of a thousand years previously. Some were looking for the Messiah to be a great military leader who'd lead an uprising and overthrow the Romans. But Jesus didn't come to fight the Romans, but to love the Romans. And he said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And here on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, vast crowds are coming because they're intrigued by what he'll do next. They've seen him heal people. They've seen that he's not intimidated by the hostility of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They want to see what he'll do now. So we have this picture of this large crowd and Jesus giving himself a little distance from themselves so that he can tell them what he came to do, to preach about the kingdom of God. And I think this is a helpful picture, for all too often we come rushing right up to Jesus with our own thoughts and wishes, but it's good for us to prepare ourselves to hear from Jesus before charging straight in. We're near enough to see to Jesus to hear him, and in this case to see him, but that bit of distance reminds us that we have also come into the presence of the King. So Jesus starts preaching. Verse 2 tells us that he taught them many things by parables. And he starts off with this parable about four different types of soil, although we often hear it referred to as the parable of the sower. This parable, like all the parables, is at first hearing very straightforward and easy to understand what's happening. A man goes out to sow seed. As he scatters, the seed falls in different places. Some falls on the hard path where it's eaten up by birds. Some falls on rocky places, where there isn't much soil. It shoots up quickly, but because the soil is shallow, there's no root. And when the hot sun comes out, the plants wither and die. Other seed falls among weeds and thorns, so that when the plants grow, they're choked by the thorns and don't produce any grain. And still other seed falls on good soil, where it comes up, produces a crop, multiplying 30, 60 or even 100 times. And then Jesus concludes the parable by saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What are we to make of this, this story which is the first of Jesus' parables that are recorded? We know it's important because Jesus says to his disciples when he's alone with them after the crowds have gone, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? I've always wrestled to understand parables. I know they're important, but they're not like the things I normally have to deal with. They're not Agatha Christie mysteries where you look for the clues and discover the elusive secret that's evaded everybody else. Nor are they substitution codes or allegories where we find the key, figure out that X means Y, and then everything falls into place. Yes, there's an element of that parallel meaning, but it's not the whole story. And Jesus himself tells his disciples here, in verse 14, that the seed is the word. But he doesn't tell us who the farmer is. Is it God? Is it Jesus himself? Could it be the disciples? Could it be us? 
The most important lesson we draw from this is that Jesus tells us that we need to engage with the parables and not sit passively and allow them to leave us unmoved. It's not a Poirot episode, which my family will tell you all about how much I like them, that entertains us while we watch them, and then we switch it off and forget about it the moment we do something else. Once you know the solution to a Poirot mystery, there's nothing more to be learnt from it. With parables, however, it's different. We need to grapple with them so that we can be receptive to the truth that's in them and not be so hardened to them that the truth can have no foothold in us. Jesus tells his disciples in verse 11 that the parables are a means of distinguishing those who belong to the kingdom from those who are outside. This is a hard teaching. We want to think that everybody will be part of God's kingdom, that Jesus will accept any free one. And it's true that the invitation to the kingdom is for everyone. We see that in our Old Testament reading from Isaiah 55. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake their own way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to our God, for he will freely pardon. The invitation is for everyone. But there's a warning here in verse 12 when Jesus quotes from Isaiah chapter 6 saying, it's possible that we can hear his teaching quite frequently, but never understand that we can be very familiar with his words and yet not turn and be forgiven. So back to those four soils. In the parable, some seeds fall on the path and it's taken away without ever getting close to taking root. Jesus had explained, explains that for some people, as soon as they hear God's word, Satan comes and takes it away. They are hard, unreceptive soil. We've all experienced this. Some people do not, simply don't want to hear God's word. They don't want to hear the name of Jesus. They don't want to believe that Jesus is alive, that he's a claim on their life, and that he and he alone can save them from the penalty that their sin merits. And looking at that large crowd on the lakeshore, Jesus would have seen that there were those who fitted that description. They were there for the show, for the drama, for the spectacle. But they were also hardened to his teaching and wouldn't listen. Next, Jesus talks about the seed that falls on the rocky places, where there's little soil. He explains that this is like people who hear the word and receive it with joy. But when trouble or persecution comes, they fall away. Again, Jesus would have looked at the crowd on the shore and known that there would be plenty of people who were like that. They'd been excited by what they'd heard when they saw that Jesus had the power to forgive sins. They would have been thrilled when they saw him heal people. They would have been cheering Jesus on when he was confronted by the stern Pharisees. But when trouble came, they would be nowhere to be seen. It's external pressures that cause the falling away. Jesus talks of the sun coming up and scorching the plants and making them wither. Just as when people realise the full cost of following Jesus, it makes some people give up on him today. It may be the disapproval or scorn of close family and friends. But Jesus himself faced that sort of pressure at the end of chapter 3, where he points to the absolute priority of following him in obedience to his teaching over everything else. Jesus knows that trouble will come to those who follow him and he tells us that none of us will escape it. The sun scorches the seed in the other soils as well, not just those on the rocky ground. But God has the power to sustain the good seed in the good soil in the face of persecution or hardship or trouble. We're encouraged in the Bible to pray for our fellow Christians who are suffering such trials and that's why it's good that we support the work of organisations such as Open Doors, who are helping the suffering church around the world today. So that's two soils. The hard soil where nothing takes root, and the shallow soil where any growth doesn't survive any external pressure. Now Jesus turns to a third type of soil, where as well as the seed growing, there are weeds and thorns. As the seed grows, it's choked by weeds, so it doesn't produce any grain. 
In explaining this type of soil, Jesus tells his disciples that the thorns that choke the grain are the worries of this world, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things. These are the thoughts that we can cultivate in our hearts and minds, which end up robbing us of joy, of peace and of fruitfulness. While we remain convinced that Jesus is our saviour and that we want to follow him, we can also allow ourselves to be sidetracked by other concerns, many of them legitimate. In this current time of pandemic, we may be worried about getting ill or our loved ones contracting the disease. We may have concerns about not being able to see family, losing our job or having to work from home and not see work colleagues, having children at home and wondering what's happening to their education. We might have money worries, worry about our holidays, or even that your football team is really useless and is about to get relegated. All these worries can choke off the spiritual life that Jesus would plant in us and nurture through the Holy Spirit. In Matthew's Gospel, this parable is immediately followed by one where Jesus talks of a farmer sowing seeds while he sleeps and his enemy comes along and plants weeds amongst them. When Jesus was himself was tempted in the wilderness, Satan offers him a shortcut to power and riches without having to go through the cross. We who live in our materialistic world are bombarded with possibilities of a better car, better clothes, more fulfilment, and it's easy to start comparing ourselves with others who seem to have it all together. But these are deceitful because we will not find true fulfilment or happiness in these trappings of wealth. And comparisons are a dead end leading to jealousy or arrogance or pride or a combination of them all. We cannot prevent these temptations from arising. They're normal to all humanity. But we can stop them from suffocating the fruit that God would have us grow. The fruit of the Spirit, which we're told is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And then lastly, Jesus talks about the soil which produces a crop. People who hear the word and accept it, and a rich harvest is the result. It's not enough to hear the word. We have to accept it. We have to take it to heart. Just as the seed is buried in the heart of the soil, we have to let God's word penetrate into our innermost being and transform us. So what are we to make of this parable? As I've looked at it, I've wrestled with what Jesus is teaching, trying to ensure that I'm not one of those who Jesus describes in verse 12 as ever seeing but never perceiving, as ever hearing but never understanding. And my thinking hasn't followed a nice, neat, straight path. And one particular thought which has grown on me, I'm sure many of you will have had from the beginning, although it's taken me a lot longer to get there. I used to imagine, somewhat superficially, that these four separate types of people remained fixed and people stayed in the category that they were at the beginning. It's certainly easier for me to process in that way, but I don't think that's the whole story. I think it can be true of a group of people at any specific point at a time responding to a specific uh, piece of teaching from Jesus, just as Jesus taught the crowd on the shore that day. He would have known at that time that the people in front of him on that day could be divided into those four groups. And I also think it's true of us as individuals that at any given point or event in time that we can be more or less receptive to God's word and Jesus' teaching. I think back on my own experience. And when I get to heaven, one of the people I most want to see again is a chap called David Ellis, who worked on the bench beside me in an artist material factory just after I left school. We worked in the same area for two months and he told me the good news of Jesus throughout that time. And throughout that time, I was completely uninterested in what he had to say. To him, I must have seemed as hard and as unresponsive as the hard soil of the path in this parable. Yet when I came to G faith in Jesus 18 months after I'd last seen him, that seed that he had sown bore fruit. The soil of my heart had been changed. I think we can alter the soil of our heart in how we respond to God's work. I am not a gardener, as anyone who's seen my house will know, but from understanding what gardeners do, 
I understand that they prepare the soil by removing rocks and stones, by pulling out weeds, and by making the ground more receptive. We need to do the same sort of things to make ourselves more receptive to God's word. We can prepare ourselves to withstand external pressures better by resolving not to be discouraged by the scorn of others, even those closest to us. We can obey Jesus' command not to worry about what each day will bring, but resolve to trust that God will provide us each day with our daily bread. And we can train our minds against the deceitfulness of false prophecies of our world by doing as Paul encourages us to do. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And for us to do this, we need to read God's word regularly, seriously and with humility. We have to wrestle with what's written there, argue with it as we get to grips with it if needs be, but in the end we need to submit to the authority of God's word for us in our lives every day so that we too may produce a crop. I also think it's true that all of us can be a mix of those four soils at the same time. Without tending the soil regularly by studying the Bible or with prayer, we can become hard or shallow or consumed by the worries of the world. We have to wrestle with this, just as Jacob wrestled with God to get his blessing. And like Jacob, we will leave the encounter blessed, but also changed and possibly limping. Certainly, our pride and self-certainty will have taken a pummeling in the process. And one last dimension is this. We can study this parable and see three of the four outcomes as failures. And this can certainly be the case in individual instances or with individual projects. However, there is a broader picture too. The land in Galilee at that time was varied, but it was also fragile and susceptible to being overworked and denuded of nutrients. So the plants that shot up with little roots and the weeds and thorns when they died, they were absorbed back into the earth and were fertilizer for replenishing the goodness of the soil and for providing future growth. So with us, our failures can be used in providing growth for the future if we allow God to transform us and turn them into means of grace in our lives. It's not comfortable, but God can use those failures as mileposts on our pilgrimage towards his eternal kingdom. So one last unanswered question, which I raised briefly earlier, who is the farmer? The easiest answer would be that it's God. And on one level, it's true that everything comes from God. He's the creator of everything, and there is nothing that does not originate from him. But thinking more deeply, there are times when we are in the role of the farmer sowing the seeds. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul writes, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose and they will each be rewarded according to their own labour. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Paul saw himself in the role of the farmer. He saw his church, that church in Corinth, as the field, the soil that needs to be worked. Well, thinking back on my story, David Ellis was the farmer sowing God's seeds in me. The fact that God uses imperfect people to spread the teaching of Jesus is a source of great comfort and encouragement for us because in some way God chooses us to play an important part in his plan. The scattering the seed when we know that three of the four outcomes lead to what looks like failure seems wasteful to us. We like to know that we'll get a good return on our outlay. But as we read in Isaiah 55 earlier, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my, my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts and your thoughts. There are some things we don't know, and never will know, because we cannot completely know God's mind. But Jesus does reveal some of the secrets of the kingdom, which we are to take to heart and allow to instruct us. 
Jesus enjoins those who have ears to hear. This injunction is also used in his letters to each of the seven churches in Revelation. They're each told, let him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then they're promised a reward if they stand firm to the end in their faith in Jesus and warned about things that they need to correct. Jesus, the teaching king, instructs us through his word and he teaches us the joy and rewards in him which await us if we stand firm. Jesus' parables are often open-ended. They leave us to ponder them and think on them long and hard. The one thing in this parable which we do know without a doubt is that the seed is the word of God. This is the, mean that God, the means that God uses to yield a rich harvest, but it needs receptive soil. But the good news is that here, ultimately, it is God's plan that will prevail. Isaiah 55 verses 10 and 11. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Jesus came to preach the kingdom of God. Jesus came to serve. Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. Let us make sure that our hearts are prepared to receive him, to accept his teaching, so that the rich harvest of his kingdom can be found in us. pray. We pray for our world at a time of uncertainty, when there is so much anxiety, so much that is unknown, when so much of what is going on in, in our world at the moment is frightening for so many people. It's brought home our human weakness, the limits of what we can do, but also the hope in what we can do and the way that we can be and the way that we can work for others too. So Heavenly Father, in the midst of this confusion and uncertainty, opportunity and hope, where it seems that so much is changing day by day, Heavenly Father, help us to trust in you as our strength and our rock. And we pray that our world would not just lean on its own understanding and strength, but also would be turning to you. We pray for those who have political leadership, those who have leadership of pharmaceutical companies developing vaccines, those 
who have a care for a way in which we care for our world. Heavenly Father, we pray for those in influence, that they also would turn to you and know you as their rock. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray to you for the world of work. Heavenly Father, we want to pray for those for whom their business is in tatters, whether they are owners or workers. Father, we pray for those who just don't know what the future will hold. We pray for students graduating, for those out of work, for maybe those who have moved to a different country and don't know where to find work. We pray for those for whom uh, work is increasingly demanding and the challenges of doing what they've always done at this time is challenging of them emotionally and intellectually. Heavenly Father, in this fluctuating world of work, we pray that people will grasp that their, their purpose and identity is in you, not just their productivity or what they can do. Help us have a better understanding of who we truly are, our value and purpose. And we do pray for those who have to make difficult decisions, those who have to decide the future, not just of themselves, but of others. Heavenly Father, we pray that in this confusing time in the world of work, that there would be clarity, insight, and a true understanding of what it is to be human. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for holidays, for those who are able to go away, for it to be a time of rest and recuperation, that being away from the everyday would fill them afresh with the delight in your creation and your creativity. We pray for those who are able to spend time with family and friends that they haven't seen for a while, that bonds of love would be strengthened and that there would be a real enjoyment from being together. We pray too for those who will not have a holiday, for those for whom holiday season just brings back the loneliness that they experience as they have no one to go with or perhaps the means to go. And pray particularly too for those who've lost loved ones, for whom it'll be the first holiday away without somebody really special in their lives. Heavenly Father, we know that you have put rest and recreation into the order of our world and the order of our lives. Help us to enjoy and love the rest and recreation that you give. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray finally for our church here in Interviewing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way in which we've been able to support and encourage one another. And Heavenly Father, we pray for that eagerness that there would be amongst us to see your kingdom grow. Not just our church to grow, but your kingdom to grow. And we pray that you would give us a willingness in these uncertain times and in these differing circumstances to willingly embrace the things that we need to do to continue to reach out to strengthen, to grow. Heavenly Father, we pray too that you would give us, uh, in these moments of quiet over the summer, time just to reflect on your words, to join with Attic in committing ourselves again to read your word afresh and give us not just a desire to read, but a faithfulness to it. And Heavenly Father, above all, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would be at work in our hearts, equipping us and enabling us to be the people that you would have us be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We join our prayers together by saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, 
now and forever. Amen. join it in our closing prayer together. Heavenly Father, we are your children and you love us. So deep is your love that nothing we have done or thought to do can take away the peace you give. So strong is your love that no passing trouble shall tear us from your arms. So precious is your love that all our life shall be lived in your service and yours shall be the glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And a final prayer of blessing. Go on your way this week to witness to the living God in spirit and in truth. And the blessing of God, creator, redeemer and sustainer, be with you and empower you and those whom you love all day and every day. Amen. <laughs>